All right. <clears throat> so we are already at November 9th. And today we're going to be talking about gears. So let's see. Make sure everybody can hear me. Excellent. All right, we'll just give it a couple minutes here to make sure that we are, the live stream is working properly. Do we got any questions? Is the audio loud enough on your end? Thanks, Elsa. <clears throat> so, any questions before we get started? So today we're going to be talking about uh, uh, gears, particularly spur gears, um, and really just giving an overview of um, how they're designed and what the key parameters are, and then um, uh, how we how we use them with some examples. Okay. Um, so. First thing we're going to do is just cover some of the more common uh, gear types. Uh, this is the spur gear. This is a gear that we're going to be talking about today. Turns out that the gear profile for the teeth has a pretty unique shape. It's actually called an involute. Uh, and we'll describe um, the, the involute geometry and uh, why it's useful. Uh, these are cost effective. Uh, they're used on parallel shafts. They have straight teeth. Uh, they can be louder than other gear types, uh, and they provide a line contact if everything's perfectly aligned. Uh, another type of gear is the helical gear. Sometimes these are called high power gears. Uh, they're more expensive, uh, and the teeth remain in contact longer than the spur gears, allowing higher loading, uh, and they're typically quieter than spur gears. Um, the angle uh, of the teeth, as you can see here, uh, causes a thrust load, um, and that thrust load has to be counteracted by a um, uh, thrust bearing or uh, other type of bearing surface to counteract that load. Uh, they can accommodate non-parallel shafts, as you can see here. This is a 90-degree orientation of these helical gears. Uh, and they also have involute teeth. So they have the same type of teeth uh, that you see in the spur gears. We also have bevel gears, um, and they have uh, a mating cone surface, and they provide 90-degree, um, typically 90-degree uh, transmission of torque. Um, when we talk about gears, the larger of a gear set, and a gear set is a, a pair of gears that are meshed and the larger of the gears is usually called the gear and the smaller of the gears is usually called the pinion okay and so bevel gears are used to transmit torque at 90 degrees and they provide a speed reduction of about two to one to five to one commonly 
Okay. Um, <clears throat> speed reduction means that we get an increase in torque and uh, based on the conservation of power. So torque times angular velocity is the power. So you can change the torque or change the angular velocity. Um, so uh, many gear applications are um, a speed reduction application, uh, like an engine transmission in a car, for example. Uh, we also have worm gears or worm sets. Uh, these uh, use screw leads or screw threads, and it's much like a, a screw and the geometry of a nut, and they can allow for large uh, reductions um, in speed in a pretty small package. Uh, like 20 to 1 to 100, 100 to 1, and they're made in matched sets. Okay, so you can see, um, you know, if the bevel gear, you get the 90 degree, but you can only get like a 2 to 1 uh, speed reduction. The worm gear, you also get the uh, 90 degree, uh, but you get the 20 to 1 or uh, up to 100 to 1, maybe, and I'm sure specialty gears are outside this range. Uh, and then with spur gears, we usually are operating uh, about 10 to 1 for a gear set. And a gear set means a driving and a driven gear meshed. Okay, so these are some of the common types of gears. And um, <clears throat> what we're going to talk about now is just uh, an overview here, okay, of the fundamental law of gearing. Now, ideally, uh, if we could have two rolling cylinders that didn't slip with one another, it would be a pretty ideal way of transmitting torque. <clears throat> um, and that would be the simplest way. Uh, but if you get into uh, higher load applications, you can get slipping. And then if the surfaces uh, wear or whatever, then you also get slipping and other problems. And if you have, your, you have to have a system that the output is phased with the input, uh, then you uh, wouldn't be able to <clears throat> use this type of uh, rotating cylinders. Okay, so what we do is we essentially have ro rolling cylinders uh, with teeth on them, and we call them gears, and that allows us to transmit higher torque. Uh, the smaller of two gears is the pinion, and so in this case, this would be the gear, and this would be the pinion. Um, if we um, if we have gears like this, where we have an external gear, then the direction changes. If we have an internal gear, then the direction remains the same, the direction of rotation. Um, gears are used uh, to um, change the velocity, increase the torque, or vice versa. So we use the exchange torque for velocity or velocity for torque. Um, Ideally, gears would have a very smooth velocity profile, and uh, much of the gear um, work in the last, you know, 40 years has been to make uh, better surfaces for gears. Um, and so because gears have to have a smooth velocity profile, that leads us to the fundamental law of gearing, which says that the angular velocity ratio between the gears of a gear set must remain constant throughout the mesh. Another way of saying that is when the teeth are in contact with one another, the velocity ratio between the input gear and the output gear, or the driving gear and the driven gear, has to remain the same. And it turns out when you're rotating, um, you need a specific geometry to do that. The velocity ratio is the ratio of the output speed to the input speed, or the ratio of the input radius of the, pi the pitch radius of the input gear to the pitch radius of the output gear. And we'll define these terms uh, better later. The positive or negative sign has to do with if we have a internal or external gear um, because it changes the direction that it's rotating. Okay, so internal gears have the same direction and external gears have the optional, uh, uh, opposite direction. Okay, and, and that's shown here. Okay, so this is an external gear. Okay, so if it rotates this way, then that means this gear rotates this way. This is an internal gear. If this gear rotates this way, this gear also rotates in that cl clockwise orientation. 
the mechanical advantage or the torque ratio of a gear set is one over the velocity ratio. So it's the inverse of the velocity ratio. Okay, so on one, one hand we can look at the, um, the torque multiplier or the speed multiplier, and that's how they're defined. The mechanical advantage is the input speed over the output speed or the input radius, or the output radius over the input radius, and the signs are the same convention for the same reasons. Okay? When we talk about um, gear, spur gears, um, and spur gear teeth, they have a very specific shape. Okay? So if you look over here and you see this shape right here, this is an involute. Okay, so this is the shape that you would get if you had a string that was wrapped around the base circle of the gear and you slowly unwrapped the machine, uh, the, the string, and it has some uh, unique properties. And this, this is what the gear tooth profile is made of. Okay, so when we look at the gear teeth um, that, uh, for spur gears and for... Uh, helical gears, they have this involute as their, their gear tooth. Um, and it's, uh, it's a good, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ideal shape for, dri uh, for driving gears um, because of, of certain properties, okay? So the spur gear teeth are made for them involute from, the, from unwrapping a string from the base circle. It can be made... Um, um, <clears throat> when the string is unwrapped, okay, the string is always tangent to the base circle. Okay, so if you see here, at any point in time, uh, as you're unwrapping the string, if you follow the string, it's tangent to the base circle. Okay, so if you follow the string, it's tangent to the base circle. So, okay, these are the ta tangent lines to these, the string as it's being unwrapped. Uh, the center of curvature of the involute is always at the point of tangency of the string with the base circle. And the tangent to the involute is always normal to the string. Okay, so if we take the tangent line at any point uh, here where the string is unwrapped, the tangent line of the involute is always perpendicular uh, to the um, radius of uh, cur curvature of the involute. And what that means is that when the loads are applied, okay, and what we'll see that when the gear teeth um, are meshed, they roll along the surface and those loads are transmitted along these radial lines to the same base circle. And that's why we always have the same gear ratio. Um, it effectively act, allows the gear teeth to act like rolling cylinders, okay? Yeah, and the forces, they follow down the string to the same radius, giving us a constant ratio, as though the two cylinders are rolling without slip. So it's a, a very clever uh, shape, the envelope, and it affords us the opportunity to um, have gears that mesh and have a uh, long life. Um, okay. So when we talk about gears, there's <clears throat> um, some nomenclature that we have to sort of understand okay and that is the uh, that's shown here in this image okay so here's the base circle that's the base circle that that we would run uh, unwrap the involute okay we have uh, here this point right here which runs perpendicular to both of the gears this is called the pitch point okay and at the time when the gears are touching at the pitch point, it looks like they have perfect rolling without slipping. It's not true for the whole involute profile, but at this point right here, um, in an ideal conditions, the, the pitch point, the two gear teeth are rolling on the pitch point, okay? And that pitch point, if we follow it along, uh, we take that radius, okay? Uh, called the pitch radius, and we have a pitch radius for the gear, okay? And we also have a pitch radius for the pinion, and these are these red uh, dashed lines, and they intersect the pitch point, and they follow along to the respective uh, gear or pinion, okay? So if we're over here, this is the uh, pitch radius of the gear. 
Now, when these two teeth are in contact with one another at the pitch point, there's an angle that's formed, and that's called our pressure angle, okay? And so uh, the normal to that contact location uh, can be projected out, out here, and the angle that that normal makes with the perpendicular of the centers of the shafts here, that's called your pressure angle, okay? The velocity here is the velocity of the pitch point, and at this point in time, it's that point in space is um, um, perpendicular to the line that runs through the two gears. Uh, we also have um, a, a um, portion of the gear uh, that we call the addendum. This is this distance here, and that's from the tip of the gear to the pitch point. This top of the tooth is called the addendum. Okay, and <clears throat> see here. And I think that's um, uh, all the the thing the the um, things we want to point out in this particular graph. Okay. Um, the for forces go through the same point for each uh, the gear and pinion, and that's what gives us a constant ratio. Um, the involute only exists outside of the base circle. Okay, so what that means is that for this base circle, the involute tooth profile has to be above or outside of the base circle for the gear. Uh, the line of action, that's this line here where the, the forces are um, uh, projected, um, it's, it always passes through the pitch point. Okay, so that's the nomenclature for um, the gear. When a gear um, meshes with another gear, um, in the case here what you see is we have a gear that this is the beginning of the contact and what this um, graphic shows is as it roll as, as it goes through the meshing and it l l leaves contact over here it it actually traverses a line or a length of action okay from when it first contacts to when it last con when that when that tooth con when the tooth of the pinion um, contacts the uh, tooth of the gear um, until it leaves contact, that line that it traverses is called the length of the action. Okay, um, the arc um, that the angle from the beginning of contact to the pitch point is called the angle of approach, and the angle uh, from the pitch point to when it leaves contact is called the angle of recess. Okay. And uh, you can use the geometry of the uh, radius of the pinion, the addendum of the pinion, um, the pressure angle, and the distance between uh, the centers to calculate that. And this is the same variables for the gear to calculate this uh, length of action between the gears. So you can see um, what distance they are in contact with one another. If we have a gear that has, if one of the gears, um, in this case, the um, the gear ha is would be the larger of the two. That would be what we call the rack. If the if the gear has an infinite radius, then uh, what we have is actually a, a rack. Okay, so this is a rack and pinion. I'm sure you're probably familiar with them, um, and the shape that you get if you draw the involute is actually a straight line because in this case the um, the string if you were to wrap it around the cylinder as you approach infinity actually uh, becomes a straight line and so we actually get this trapezoidal uh, profile which is in fact an involute uh, if we have a rack um, which is an infinite radius gear so this is the gear this is the pinion because it's the smaller of the two and uh, if we unwrap the string to try to make an envelope, that's just a straight line, and we get these uh, this gear profile uh, for a rack. 
Okay. <clears throat> so um, the uh, pitch point uh, between the gears, um, you can only have a pitch radius if you have a pitch point. So obviously the gears have to be meshed. If the gears are meshed, then you get a pitch pitch radius. And that radius is the distance from the center of the gear uh, to that uh, circle that goes through the uh, pitch point. Now, um, what's unique about the envelope gears is that if you move the um, gears, and obviously this is going to happen because you don't have perfect manufacturing tolerances, you don't have perfect assembly tolerances, and you have wear, then the gears won't be perfectly aligned. So what happens if they're not perfectly aligned? Well, let's say, for example, that uh, this uh, pinion here, if this is the gear, call this the pinion, if the pinion is moved up to a new location, what that causes is it causes a change in, in where the uh, two gears um, contact and the angle of contact uh, changes as well. And in this case, we take a 20-degree uh, pressure angle, which is a standard angle for spur gears. Um, and if we move it too much or we move it back, then it increases that pressure angle. What's interesting, though, is that the velocity ratio remains the same. Okay? And so the, the law of fundamental law of gearing, um, which requires that the uh, velocity... Uh, ratio remains the same is maintained by using this involute uh, gear ratio. There are some drawbacks though because you're actually going to get more rubbing uh, or more sliding rolling um, when you have a larger pressure angle uh, which can accelerate wear and you will also have slightly larger backlash and we'll talk about that. Okay so backlash is present in all uh, spur gears it, and it's the gap where there is no motion in the output gear when the input gear changes direction so um, you've probably felt it before like if you've grabbed a gear train and you uh, rotated it back and forth you can uh, feel that little bit of slop well that's what we call backlash and if you have an old car um, you may have felt it in the steering wheel or if you turn one way, you can hear it uh, grab, then you can turn it the other way. And for a small little um, bit of motion, you don't get any output um, in your wheels from a change in input in the steering wheel. Uh, that's also um, backlash. Now, there's specialty devices like harmonic drives um, that uh, virtually eliminate uh, backlash because they actually um, – they um, um, deform the gear surface uh, and also there's preloading and anti-backlash gears and other techniques ca that can be used to prevent backlash. Now backlash isn't a big deal if you're only going in one direction and you stay on most of the time okay but it can be a huge deal if you have a servo system and you are trying to control the output of of your system or say the control the position and the servo motor is trying to say okay well go this way oh we went too far go back oh nothing happened go back more oh we went too far and that's called hunting okay where because you don't have the precision in the the drive mechanism you can't get the resolution in the output position that you would require Okay, so that can cause problems if um, you're expecting to have a precision output and control that output to a, a high precision um, position if you have too much slop or backlash uh, in your gears. If you want to relate backlash to the actual gear geometry, the, the backlash is the difference between the two thickness and the uh, space, space width, which is between the gears, okay? So because we don't have perfect manufacturing tolerances, you have to have some gap between those two, and the backlash is always going to be present in gears, and it's because of this difference between the two thickness and the space width. So any questions so far? So... <clears throat> 
see here. So just see if there's any questions. I'll monitor the chat. If you have them, just lay them in there. So although the gear set has pure rolling at the pitch point, other points of contact during the mesh along the involute cause some sliding motion, uh, which increases the surface stresses and can cause uh, uh, surface fatigue. Okay, so in chapter seven, uh, there's a table that has surface to fatigue strength data for uh, different metals. And this is just a small snapshot of the table. There's a lot more items on the table. I think it goes over two pages. Uh, but you can see here that if you're in pure rolling, okay, um, versus if you're in rolling and you have 9% sliding, that you're going to get um, different uh, st uh, factors to calculate your stresses. Okay. So um, here you can see that if you have pure rolling, you can take um, a um, stress of 216,000 PSI, but if you have rolling plus 9% sliding, like in gear teeth, you can only take 180,000 uh, PSI at 1 times 10 to the 8 cycles. Okay. So this presence, this alignment is a big deal, and you want them to be aligned, and you want to make sure you're using the right data uh, to make sure that your gears are going to um, last as, uh, how, however long you, you want them to, to last and how you design them to last. Okay. All right. So uh, going a little bit deeper into the gear nomenclature, we have uh, the circular pitch, and that's the arc length along the pitch circle between the teeth, okay? So this is the pitch circle, and that's uh, the point of contact w between this and the other gear would be the pitch point. And so if we follow that pitch circle around, okay, uh, this is the pitch circle, and it's pi times d, which d is the pitch diameter, okay? So that's the diameter uh, here over in, and that's the uh, number of teeth. And this parameter uh, defines the tooth size, okay? Um, sometimes um, we need to know the uh, base pitch, okay? And that's the tooth pitch measured from the base circle. So that's the base circle. That's the circle that we use to define the involutes, okay? And this is the base pitch, okay? So these are not the same. Okay, so the circular pitch, the base pitch are not the same. The base pitch is always smaller than the circular pitch. Um, the diametral pitch, it's more convenient um, method to use because we don't uh, worry about calculating it based upon the uh, circumference ratio with the teeth. We just use the number of teeth and divide it by the diameter. And so this is commonly what's used to define the gears. And it's just the number of teeth uh, divided by the diameter. Uh, the relationship between the diametral pitch and the circular pitch is just pi over pi c. Um, and this is how a lot of gears are defined. And it's kind of an odd unit because it's just a number in. So, okay, this will be like the number of teeth over the diameter. So the units are in one over typically inches or one over millimeters. Um, and that makes it a little bit confusing when you first come into gears and you're trying to define them uh, because it's uh, interesting. Once you get used to it, it's uh, not that bad. Uh, metric gears and uh, U.S. gears don't uh, are not friends. They don't. They can't be on the same gear train. And um, in the metric system, as other units, they have a little bit more clever way of doing it that actually relates to uh, real geometry of. <clears throat> Uh, that we can uh, relate to the the distance per or the diameter per the number of gear teeth and that's called the module and that's what you'll see if you go to look up gears um, you'll see that okay in um, metric units you'll see the module instead of the diametral pitch uh, we can go convert back to back to uh, inches if for some reason you need to do that, although the gear trains are not interchangeable um, just by multiplying because it's in millimeters, so you multiply by 24 divided by the uh, 
diametral pitch. So we can uh, also define the velocity ratio in terms of the input and output radius uh, or the input and output uh, diameter, uh, pitch diameter, or the uh, input and output of the number of teeth. Okay, and because the um, mechanical advantage is one over the velocity ratio, then we would just flip this ratio if we wanted to know the uh, mechanical advantage. Um, the gear ratio is is always greater than one. Okay, it's typically um, and it's always the uh, larger gear, in, in this case the gear over the pinion. Okay. Okay, so that's that's our gear ratio. So if you have a 10 to 1 gear, then the gear is the 10 and the pinion is the 1. Uh, this is the AGMA. It's the American Gear Manufacturers Association. They have tons and tons of literature on gears. It's uh, truly a uh, whole world to explore. But these are some of the... Um, this is the common uh, full depth gear tooth specification and there are specialty gears out there uh, this is really just a very very broad overview of commonly used gears okay um, the most common angle is a 20 degree uh, pressure angle um, you can also get them in 14 and a half which are more obsolete or 25 degrees and you can see here this is what the different geometries look like. So this is a 14 and a half degree uh, pressure angle. This is a 20 degree pressure, pressure angle, the most common. Uh, this is a 25 degree uh, pressure angle. Okay. And we'll go into the loading in the next lecture and we can kind of see the relationship between these parameters and loading. But for now, it's enough to just kind of understand uh, the, the grammar. Okay. This is a, uh, a wheel which shows some different AGMA um, defined shapes uh, from these parameters okay so if we have a pressure angle we pick the pressure angle and then you have the addendum the didendum and I, th I don't think I mentioned what that is but the didendum is the addendum is the distance of the tooth that's above the pitch circle and the didendum is the uh, amount of material uh, below uh, the the pitch circle uh, to the addendum circle, and that follows the face of the, the gears, okay? So the addendum is the part of the tooth that's above the pitch circle. The addendum is the part of the tooth that's below the pitch circle. Um, <clears throat> we have standard diametral pitches, okay? And keep in mind the diametral pitch is the number of gear teeth over the um, pitch diameter, okay? So this is the number of gear teeth over the pitch diameter, and these are the typical numbers, okay? So <clears throat> this is the case where we have um, a diametral pitch that's less than 20. These are some standard diametral pitches, okay? And uh, that's for coarse gears, and these are for fine gears, okay? Which are defined as uh, greater than 20, okay? And so you see here, the uh, coarse gears, this is 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and then 12, 14, 16, 18, and then we get into 20. When we're 20 or more, this defines these are fine uh, gear teeth all the way up to um, 80 in this case. Okay, these are your metric module sizes, and they are um, in units of uh, millimeters. And here's the diametral pitch equivalent over here in um, 1 over inches. Okay, and you can kind of see um, how they uh, relate to one another. Although they're not compatible, you can get a, a sense of <clears throat> if you're replacing um, a gear train and all you have is that, that was metric and all you have is uh, U.S. gears readily available, then you can uh, kind of match them this way. All right. So the rest of these parameters um, are defined um, from the di diametral pitch. So you can see that that is the driving uh, parameter um, for the gears. Uh, if you go to McMaster Car and you want to go find a gear for your application, uh, this is just uh, uh, spur gears, a bunch of spur gears that are brass and carbon steel, either hardened or not hardened. And you can get a sense for 
Um, <clears throat> how much they cost? Looks like the cheapest ones here are about thirteen dollars, all the way up to let's see here about sixty bucks. Um, and they have sh uh, pitch diameters um, going all the way up to three inches that are readily available. And this is your pitch. Okay, this is the number of teeth. And this is your pitch diameter, okay? So if you look at this number, 16 over 64 equals 0.25, okay? And if you look over here, 48 over 48, it equals one inch. So that's the nomenclature that you would need to kind of get a sense of how to pick the different gears. Um, so we have a question, um, why is the involute shape used so much? Well, the involute shape is used so much because that when the gears are meshed, it, at least at the pitch point, allows the gears to act as though they are uh, rolling with one another without slipping. So it minimizes the slipping, um, and it gives an ideal surface for the two gears to act as though there are two cylinders that are rolling um, uh, uh, across the, the other. Okay, so I hope that answers your question. Feel free to follow up if it doesn't. Um, if, if we have too few teeth on a gear, um, then the dedendum of the gear, remember that's the amount, that's the material that's below the uh, pitch diameter. Um, so if there's too few teeth, the dedendum of the gear has to extend below the base circle. And so that what that means is when the gear is cut, it'll cause undercutting to avoid interference. Um, and so um, when you have too few teeth, if you still need to get the meshing, you can have uh, larger teeth because there's fewer teeth. And in order to prevent the tooth from uh, grinding into the side of the adjacent tooth as it uh, rotates, um, these have to be undercut. So when these are undercut, you remove material and you have less material to pick up the forces and so you have higher stresses. Okay, so what's recommended is that we uh, pick a minimum number of full depth teeth according to this equation which is related to the pressure angle uh, between the gear teeth, okay? Um, over here, this is for rack and pinion, the minimum number of teeth for rack and pinion and the maximum number of teeth so that we don't run into issues of um, undercutting here. This is for rack and pinion, um, and this is for um, the minimum number of teeth to avoid interference between a full depth Pinion and a full depth wrap. Okay, sorry, this is between gears. Um, and this is for full depth pinion and full depth gears of various sizes. Okay, so here's your min and max numbers to avoid um, the situation where you've defined teeth that are going to interfere or that when they're made they have increased stress because there's reduced area. Um, some applications, however, will require a smaller number of teeth for your design. And if that's the case, uh, a more recently defined standard uh, allows you to use profile shifted uh, teeth. And in this case, they took the involute and they actually shifted it down into um, the gear. Uh, and so the pro is you now have um, the pinion teeth actually have more material but the cons uh, is, is that you have actually more sliding velocity and more friction, okay? So if you require a very compact design, then you can use what are called profile shifted gears. And what that is, is it's taken the involute and it has shifted it into the, the gear, okay? And so it's, <clears throat> it's a way for you to have a more compact design. So we have another question. Yes, the uh, type the the book does have a typo. So Elsa said um, um, diametral pitches PD is less than twenty for course. If so, the textbook has a typo. So um, let me show you where that is. So if you look here at this table, this table is actually different than your textbook. For some reason, it was printed with a greater than sign here. 
I think that's what you're talking about. So this is correct, okay? Um, in the textbook, it, they both say greater than, but you can actually see. I mean, it goes from 1 to 18, and it goes from 20 to 120, and it says the same thing over here where we have the pitch diameter. Our diametral pitch here is less than 20 for coarse, okay? And over here is for fine, okay? Uh, next question is for two gears to match, do the diametral pitches need to be identical? Absolutely not, okay? Um, they do not need to be. And um, because, again, the diametral pitch is the number of teeth over the diameter, and so if you want to have a, uh, a gear uh, ratio, then you want to change the number of teeth, okay? All right, and, and this is another way of maybe answering your question. Duncan is... Often you'll have a pinion that's smaller, and it has its own pitch circle, okay? And it'll be smaller than the pitch circle of the gear. Okay, so the diametral pitch uh, is not going to be the same. All right. So that brings us to another concept of gears where we, we need to know if we're designing an application, uh, we can't just go pick gears and imagine that everything's going to work well. Okay, we need to make sure that we have enough gears in contact um, during the uh, operation of, of your machine. Okay, and we can do that with this ratio here, which is uh, M sub P, and this is the contact ratio. And it tells you how many, uh, an average of how many teeth are in contact at any given time, and it comes from that parameter Z, and that parameter Z was the um, the length of the contact um, here. This is the length of the action Z, okay, so that's how long it's in contact, so that's an important parameter. If you want to know if more than one tooth is in contact, then you can use the um, <clears throat> that length of action parameter as well as um, the um, base pitch, okay? That's not the diametral pitch, that's the base pitch. And the base, base pitch is de defined as the um, pitch circle um, times the cosine of the pressure angle, okay? So we can combine these together uh, or express it in terms of the diametral pitch and get this contact ratio, which is uh, probably more easy, easier to do based upon a gear of a known geometry. Okay, so contact ratio of 1.2 or greater is required for smooth motion. Okay, so if you want your uh, um, gear to transmit velocity smoothly, uh, then you want to have a contact ratio of 1.2 or greater. So um, you can't just go order a bunch of gears and then slap them together and expect it to work. I need to make sure that um, the gears that you pick are going to uh, meet these criteria, okay? Uh, so this is the example from your book. It just kind of shows you how to put all of these different parameters together, and I'll just talk through it really quickly. Um, in this case, it says, hey, we're given a six uh, pitch diameter, 20 degree pressure angle, 19 tooth pinion and a 37 tooth gear, okay? So maybe you picked these out because you like this ratio of 37 to 19. You picked a standard uh, pressure angle and you uh, picked a, a pitch diameter um, here. And you wanna make sure that your gear ratio, circular pitch, base pitch, pitch diameter, pitch radii, center distance, addendum to addendum, hole depth, clearance, outside diameters, contact ratio of the gear set with given parameters. So really you want to know this contact ratio. And then they ask, well, what happens if the center distance uh, from one gear to the other is increased by 2%? So let maybe uh, whoever drilled the hole uh, to put the bearing in, uh, put it in the wrong place. So what effect does that have on the pressure angle? <clears throat> okay, so the gear ratio is just obviously the ratio of the gears. Remember we said the gear is the larger of the two. Okay, it's greater than one. Okay, so we have a... Um, the pinion has 19 teeth, 19 tooth pinion, 37 tooth gear. 
uh, if they didn't say one was a pinion, one was a tooth, you would always say this is a gear because it has a higher number. In this case, we have a gear ratio of about two. Uh, we can calculate the circular pitch um, from some of the equations that we just showed um, or from the pitch diameter. Okay, so the circular pitch in this case is pi over B PD. In this case, we're told that it's six. So we have pi over six is 0.5 inches, 0.5 to four inches. And then we can calculate the base pitch. The base pitch um, on the measured circle is just the pitch, uh, the circular pitch times the cosine of the pressure angle, which we're told is 20 degrees. Now this is gonna change if we move this center distance, okay? And we'll see that here in a second. Um, the pitch diameters and the pitch radio of both uh, gears can be found then, okay? So we have here uh, the number of teeth over six is 3.167, and that's the uh, pitch diameter. Okay, the pitch radius obviously is half that. That's for the pinion, and for the gear, we have the same thing. And um, that gives us a radius of 3.083. The center to seven, center difference is going to be um, <clears throat> this radius plus this radius, okay? And that'll tell us what the distance between where we need to place the gears, where we need to locate them in the machine. Okay. The addendum and the dedendum, they're found using the equations that are in table 12-1 uh, in your book from the AGMA, from the American Gear Manufacturing Associ Manufacturers Association. So we find that the addendum is that's the distance of the tooth that's above the pitch circle is 0.167, and the dedendum is uh, the portion of the tooth that's below the pitch circle, and it's 0.2. Uh, the whole depth, HT, is the sum of the addendum and addendum. That's the height of the tooth. Okay, it's 0.375 inches. The clearance is the clearance between the addendum and the addendum. So if we take the difference, that would be when the gears are meshed. Um, that's the clearance. Actually, let me... I think that's the clearance between that and the other gear. <clears throat> I have to double check. I'm not 100% sure, but I think that's what it is. The outside diameter of each gear is the pitch diameter plus the two addenda. Okay. So we have the pitch diameter, and then we have the outside diameter of each gear. That's the This diameter encompasses all of the gear and all of the pinion. And then we can use those parameters for the uh, radius for the pinion, the addendum of the pinion, and the radius of the gear, and the addendum of the gear to calculate the contact ratio in terms of the um, that contact length. <clears throat> okay, and we can see here that when we get Z, we divide it by um, the base pitch. Okay, and we can get our uh, parameter that tells us that we have 1.62 teeth in contact. Um, at any given time, which is which is good, which is greater than 1.2, which means that we should have smooth velocity. If the center distance is increased from the nominal value, okay, by 2%, that's what it says here. What happens if the center distance is increased? And that's if you know somebody screws up and put the hole in the wrong place, or you had some manufacturing tolerances, or you measured it wrong, or whatever happened, you put the gear in the wrong place. Then what happens to the pressure angle? Well, uh, we can calculate the new pressure angle based upon the new uh, uh, size, the 2% increase, and it gives us about a 23-degree pressure angle, which is going to increase the uh, surface wear for that gear and increase the amount of sliding contact in addition to rolling. Okay. So <clears throat> are there any other questions? So feel free to put your questions in the chat. Okay. And so really the whole point here is we just need to kind of understand the language around gears and the parameters that are important because at the end of the day we need to, uh, if we want to transmit torque using gears, we need to know how to put them into a machine. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so 
Um, a gear train, we have simple uh, and compound gear trained. A simple gear train is something like that's shown here, okay, where we have an input gear uh, here. So it's some input velocity, and then we're going to have some output gear with some output velocity. Um, <clears throat> a pair of gears is a gear set, okay? A pair of gears is a gear set, and the simplest, um, and, it, and it's the simplest gear train. So that's just two gears, a pair of gears, just two gears. We call that a gear set. That's the simplest gear train, but we can have um, any number of gears in a gear train. Usually, though, for sport gears, you want to limit your gear ratio to about 10 to 1, okay? And the reason for that is for what we said between the minimum and the maximum amount of teeth. We want to, we want, uh, we're, that's in keeping the pinion um, above the minimum number of teeth. Okay, so usually we want to have a 10 to 1 ratio um, so that we have all the material in the teeth. We don't have any undercutting um, or rubbing. So a simple gear train uh, is where each shaft only carries one gear. Okay, so we have uh, we have six gears. Or actually, we have uh, five gears. We have uh, five shafts. Okay, so each gear has its own shaft. And it turns out that the intermediate gear ratios, they all cancel out. Okay, so the velocity ratio is going to be N2 over N3. It's minus because they're changing directions. And then minus N3 over N4 minus N4 over N5, and minus N5 over N6, because we have a negative sign here just because those are external gears for each one, and they um, they change the direction of the velocity, okay? Now, the gears in the middle are called idlers, and if you look at it, that's because we only have the input gear over the output gear, and all these other gears magically disappeared, and that's because they canceled out, okay? So... These are called idler gears here in the middle, okay? And the end gear ratio is N2 over N6. If you have an odd number of uh, gears, it results in the same output as, this, as the input, okay? So in this case, we're going this way. And then down here, because we have five gears, we're also going this way, okay? Because we have an odd number of gears. If you have an even number of gears, then you're going to change the direction, okay? <clears throat> and if you forget that, just like think if you have two gears, you're changing the direction. If you add another gear, then you're getting the same direction in the output shaft if you have an idler in between. Okay. <clears throat> so we can also have compound gear trains, okay, and that allows us to have gear ratios that are uh, greater than 10 to 1. Um, if we want a gear ratio greater than 10 to 1, we can uh, use compound gears. And these are arranged with more than one gear on a shaft in a parallel or parallel series parallel arrangement. Okay. Um, and in this case, what we get is the velocity ratio is the product of the number of teeth on the driver gears divided by the product of the number of teeth on the driven gears. Okay. So here we have an input shaft. Here, so that's a driving gear that's that makes N3 a driven gear, uh, which makes N4 because it's on the same shaft a driving gear, and it makes N5 a driven gear. And we have an output shaft that's not in line with the input shaft, and that's called non-reverted gear train. Okay, and so in this case, <clears throat> we have N2 over N3, N2 over N3, the driving over the driven times N4 over N5, which is the driving over the driven gears. Okay, so in our velocity ratio here is the product of the number of teeth on driving, driver gears. Okay, so we have N2 and N4. That's N2 and N4. Those are our driving gears. And then we have N3 and N5. Those are our driven gears. Okay, so this um, shows a different orientation of the same gear um, uh, the same velocity ratio, or in this case we have input shaft, okay, and the input shaft is driving uh, N3 just as before, which is driving N4, but in this case we put N5 on the opposite side and um, in line with the input shaft. This is called a reverted gear train, okay, where we revert the input back in line with the input shaft, and this is what your automatic transmission does, okay? 
in your automobile. <clears throat> okay. Um, so how do we design a compound gear? Um, this is a, just a real simple example. Let's say we want a compound skirt spur gear train for 29 to 1. Because at 29 to 1 is greater than the 10 to 1, so we probably need to have a gear train. Um, and we can get the product of the driven gears over the product of the, uh, I mean, the product of the drive gears over the product of the driven gears. And so if we have a compound gear train, that will give us a higher um, gear ratio. Uh, they say the largest gear, gear ratio for any gear set should be 10 to 1 and the minimum number of teeth in any pinion from that table um, is 12. Okay, so we want to limit that. So the required gear is too large for one stage gear set, but would be, uh, but two would be within the 10 to one limitation. limitation. So um, we can get an idea of the gear set ratio quickly by taking the square root of the desired gear ratio. Okay, and that's, that's basically saying like if you had the same gear ratio squared, okay, then you can take that desired gear ratio, take the square root of it and get a starting point uh, to find that, okay? And so what you do then is you can take um, the gear set here and you pick the standard, try to get to the standard numbers, okay? So you, you choose a 12, 13, and 14. Okay, that gives the smallest possible pinion. Okay. And then uh, we come over here and we look at uh, 13 times 5.385 gives us 70. Okay. So that'll be close to the ratio that we want. So then to try two gear sets. Uh, with 13 teeth and 70 teeth. So if you have 70 over 13, 70 over 13, um, that's really close to um, 29. So if it's close enough, then the problem is solved. Okay. Okay, and it says note that two identical gear sets in a compound train automatically reverts it, allowing the input and output shafts to be concentric. So what they're saying is if you have this gear here and then this gear uh, here like this and you use the same ratio um, then it's automatically uh, reverting okay so the last thing we're going to talk about is uh, epicyclic or planetary gear trains okay and these are a little bit more complicated um, if you want to get into the details um, you can go to Norton's book, uh, Design of Machinery, not machine design, but Design of Machinery, and they get into the details of the kinematics, but this is a broad overview. Um, so <clears throat> when we have gear trains, they have one degree of freedom. Basically, you can turn one gear and the other gear will turn. Um, if you have epicyclic or planetary gear trains, you have two degrees of freedom, and that allows for all sorts of different uh, types of motion, okay? And so uh, the two degrees of freedom are you can rotate two, like in this case you can rotate the sun gear and you can rotate the arm, and then the output th of the planet is defined. Or you can um, uh, pick any other two and get the, the third, right? So we can rotate two and three, and that defines the angular motion of the arm. Or we can drive the arm and drive the planet, and get the sun to move. Uh, but what's commonly done is uh, one of these is grounded, and that means it's, it's fixed to zero or fixed to the frame of, of your machine, okay, or the frame of your device. Um, <clears throat> the benefit is that these planetary gear trains, they can have uh, much higher gear train ratios in smaller packages. Uh, they're automatically reverted by default because they have, they're aligned along the same axis Okay, here, uh, and they can have concentric bidirectional inputs from a single unidirectional input, and basically that just means if um, you can um, you can uh, drive it in, on on one axis and get different outputs. Okay, these are used everywhere in transmission, gearboxes, drill motors, etc. 
often uh, the sun is driven along with the arm. Okay, so these are driven. Okay, and then the planet motion is 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 the out could be the output, but it's often uh, difficult. Like if you have this planet gear here, it's difficult to kind of har harvest that motion for an application. And so what's typically done is a ring gear is added. Okay, when people think of planetary gears, they usually think of the ring gear as well. But really this is the uh, planetary or epicyclic gear set. This is a planetary gear set that actually has a ring gear. Okay, in this case we have an 80 tooth ring gear, 20 tooth planet, and 40 tooth sun gear. Um, and often the, the uh, ring is added, okay, um, so that we can get uh, different out, out, output motion. Okay, this is a side view of it. This shows the uh, ring gear here. This shows the planet. Okay, and this shows the sun gear. And they're all um, um, acting around the, the same axis. Um, we can find the gear ratio for planetary gear trains based upon the kinematics of the gear train. And this is done by looking at the angular velocity of, a, of the gear, and that's the angular velocity of the arm plus the angular velocity of the gear with respect to the arm. Okay, so the way to do the analysis here is you basically just start with a gear and then go to the last gear. Okay, so if we can start from uh, inside out or outside in, but whatever one we do, we have to keep the bookkeeping right. Okay, so we can choose the first gear in the system and rearrange this equation so that we are solving for the relative velocity, okay? And the relative velocity is the angular velocity of the first gear minus the angular velocity of the arm. And we can do the same thing for the last gear, solve for the relative velocity of the last gear with respect to the arm. And we get the angular velocity of the last gear minus the angular velocity of the arm. And then uh, if we def defy divide the last by the first, that gives us our velocity ratio, okay? And since we don't necessarily know the um, relative velocities of the last gear with respect to the arm or the first gear with respect to the arm, it allows us to express the uh, velocity ratio in terms of the angular velocity of the first and last gears in the arm. Okay, so often what will happen is we can know the, the gear ratio. Okay, in this case we have 40 and 80 and 20. And we know that the product of the, the gear ratio is a product of the number of teeth on driver gears over the product of the number of teeth on the driven gears. And then we can solve for the angular uh, velocity that we need to drive that component, that last component at. Okay? Um, and so we can look at an example here. And the question is, determine the the train ratio between the sun gear and the arm. Okay, so that's the, the sun gear, that's this gear, and the arm. Okay, the velocity ratio between the sun gear and the arm. Okay, now this analysis is for the first to last gear. Okay, so we're going to have um, N2 over N3, N2 over N3, and then N3 over N4. Okay. And this is a positive because this is an internal gear with respect to these two. And this is a negative because this is an uh, external gear with respect to two. Okay, so we take the product of the driven gears to driving gear. So it's N2 over N3 driven. I mean the driving gear, the driven gear, N2 over N3. Multiply it by N3 to N4. Okay, and the N3s cancel out. And we get 40 over 80, which is 0.5. And then uh, we can say that the the last gear is is stationary. The ring gear is held stationary. So we we're going to bolt this ring gear to the frame, and it's station it's held stationary. And then the sun gear is the first gear in the train, and the ring gear is the last gear in the train. And let's say that the arm that's this arm here. Let's say it's rotating at one revolution per minute, one RPM. And then the question is, um, what is the sun versus arm ratio? So if we solve for this, uh, we use the gear train. We 
express it in terms of the differences in angular acceleration. We take what, what's known, and that's the um, the last gear, which is the planet. I'm sorry, which is the ring. It's zero. Uh, the first gear, which is the is the driving gear, we don't uh, we don't know. Uh, and we're told that the arm is ro rotating at uh, 1 RPM. So we put 1 RPM for here, and then we solve for WF, and we find that WF is 3. Okay, so the arm, the sun to arm ratio is 3 to 1. Okay, so then we have the 3 to 1 ratio of the uh, sun to the arm in terms of the velocity ratio. Okay, so this is pretty high level. This is just sort of, let's get acquainted, get, get you to kind of look at the nomenclature for the different types of spur gear, spur gear geometry, um, difference between simple and compound uh, gear trains, and how you can use um, uh, planetary gear boxes to get a multiplied output and how you would do, begin to do some of the analysis for that. So, um, are there any questions? So there's always a question about the test. Um, I'll look at the schedule, but yeah, since <clears throat> since we're behind, I'll, I'll definitely give you enough time to get through the material before uh, giving you another test. So it'll likely be moved back in proportion to how far back we are in the class. Um, any other questions? Okay, so if there's no other questions, uh, we'll stop here. Um, and I'll send an update about the homework and test dates out on Canvas announcement. Um, you guys have a wonderful evening, and I will see you on Wednesday or talk to you on Wednesday.